Welcome to the Tech of Shrek. I was blown away when I saw uh, Shrek the first time. It's not evolutionary, it's revolutionary. I thought, wow, that's just so realistic. They completely knocked it out of the park. In Shrek, the new fully computer animated film from PDI DreamWorks, Mike Myers, Eddie Murphy, Cameron Diaz, and John Lithgow, plus a team of 300 artists and technicians, turn the classic fairy tale formula upside down. <laughs> Lampooning everything from Snow White. Ah! Hey! Oh, no, 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 no. Dead girl off the table. Where are we supposed to put it? To Little Red Riding Hood. What? As it follows the adventures of an ugly, stinky ogre and his sidekick, Donkey, in their quest to save an unconventional princess. Uh. Along the way, the computer wizards at PDI DreamWorks, creators of the critical and box office success Ants, have once again advanced the art of computer animation. This is only the fourth film ever made using the technique and um, for something that is so much in its infancy the sort of leaps and bounds that's happening overnight is really nothing short of breathtaking if we can imagine it we can make it thank you very much I'm here till Thursday I think generally if you look at the the differences between Shrek and Ants you can see pretty clearly what's been going on in terms of the the software development um, just the raw complexity of everything. In producing Shrek, the technical team at PDI DreamWorks improved the Academy Award winning proprietary tools they developed for ants to create the first realistic computer generated humans able to express both dialogue and emotion through a complex facial animation system. The film also required major advances in the creation of rich organic environments, clothing that moves, wrinkles, and reacts to light like real life fabric, and visual effects for fire and fluids of different viscosities. The biggest challenge at the beginning of the film was the, the director said, uh, we want this film to be ten times as complex as ants. And so we had this benchmark of, of ten times complexity. Oh, wow! That was really scary! Considering my goals for the movie were probably a lot higher than I really expected us to get, we've hit far more of those goals than I could have ever hoped for. I mean, I'm incredibly happy with the look and the reality of our world. Nearly 300 artists and technicians at PDI DreamWorks labored for over three years to create the storybook world of Shrek. With 31 sequences, 1,291 individual shots, 63 featured characters, and 36 unique locations, Shrek is the most ambitious computer animated film ever produced. Each medium shot of a character is comprised of over 800,000 polygons, eight times the number for a character from Ants. But perhaps the most impressive technological feat in Shrek is the creation of a fully computer-animated, human-like character. There have been 100% animated, computer graphic generated films, but they haven't taken human-like characters and sustained a story for a whole feature length. We took what was the basis for the human, near-human facial animation system and anatomically correct sort of body animation systems that were created on ants and took them 20 steps further. We have characters whose lips stick when, you, when they open their mouths. There's a little follow-through like normal people have. Every single muscle underneath the skin is moving with their speech and their facial expressions. Our artists were able to do something that was almost photorealistic. It was too good and so we really had to dial her back to make Fiona fit inside of the fairy tale world because when she got too photorealistic, she really looked out of place in it. So here's a place where technology allowed us to achieve something that if we went to the full extent of its potential, actually became incongruous with the look of the film itself. I pray that you take this favor as a token of my gratitude. Thanks. The human and near-human characters start in the hands of the technical director, who creates the systems that the animators use to bring the characters to life. The technical director begins by building a static model of the character in the computer. He then invents some controls which the animators use to move the skeletal structure and muscles. As the artist drives the controls, it results in the model changing shape one frame at a time, creating the illusion of seamless motion, similar to the technique used in stop-motion animation. 
The sophisticated motion control systems allow the character to express complex emotions and expressions. But with a wonderful team of technical directors that set up the characters who really study anatomy, um, they figure out you know, where the facial muscles are, where the fat is on the face and where the skin is loose. You know, if you notice uh, Lord Farquaad, when he frowns, he gets this furrow in his brow. When he raises his eyebrows, he gets the wrinkles here. Now tell me, where are the others? You're a monster! We're trying to create a tool that has a sort of a presentation and an interface to an animator so that when they are working with this, they're thinking, okay, now I'm, I'm making this character look mad in a way that shows he's also embarrassed, and he's embarrassed because he's been caught lying. So that's a very particular, nuanced kind of mad. Hold the phone. I think we have about 500 controls to animate the face, and it goes from when we animate the eyebrow, when we want certain shape, we, we might have four or five points here that we can just move one point at one time. So if, he, if I want a character to be mad, I can move this point down a little bit and then move this one up a little bit to get a little bit of that. Once the animators had created believable human-like characters, they began the work of putting them into a rich and detailed world with dozens of locations, thousands of props, and realistic visual effects. In developing the human-like characters for Shrek, the producers at PDI DreamWorks reasoned that they could use the award-winning proprietary facial animation tools developed on ants and apply it to the whole body structure. One thing that we learned from Anne's was we animate the face with all the muscles on the face. So what we did on track is we apply that to the whole body. When they move, we, you will see the arms might, might change shape because we have all the muscles underneath this, the structure. So when we move the animation, it looks much better. A breakthrough program called a shaper was used to achieve sophisticated facial and body movements. It works by changing a surface from the inside out. In terms of things that we actually invented, there is a new technology uh, called shapers that, that we put together, which, is a, which was a much better way of doing uh, deformations of geometry. So anytime a character is bending and you're trying to deal with what happens where that bend is taking place and uh, the way that the muscles work, that's what shapers are all about, and we use those are underlying everything in the main characters. The artists here are just amazing as far as um, breathing life into these these um, virtual characters. You might have seen a house fly, maybe even a super fly, but I bet you ain't never seen a donkey fly. <laughs> uh oh. The programmers at PDI DreamWorks needed to have technology in place at the beginning of production that would allow them to produce cutting-edge animation throughout the three-year schedule. Most of what we use on the film is proprietary software that we create here, and the foundation of it comes from a group of about 14 programmers. I'd say probably about 15 to 20 percent of what we use on the film is off-the-shelf software, and uh, we have to integrate that into the pipeline and have all of this stuff work. It's seamlessly as we can make it. Everything's a case of trial and error. For instance, we had shots of Donkey. It was actually someone's first day in production, and they made one change, which they thought was an, an innocent change. And the next day, we got back renders from about a half a dozen shots with Donkey looking like a Chia pet. Kick him to the curb. Don't mess with me. I'm the stair master. I've mastered the stairs. I wish I had to step right here, right here, and now I'd step all over it. It's just so adorable. We, we've saved those, and um, we look back at them every once in a while for, for a good laugh. There's a case where if the animator accidentally goes off the end in the sense that he asks for a shape that's not there, the face blows up, literally, absolutely blows up. The teeth pop out, the tongue sticks over there, the eyeballs pop out, the whole thing just blows up. So it's kind of freaky. I just know before this is over, I'm going to need a whole lot of serious therapy. Look at my eye twitching. Each character presented a complex set of technical challenges. Art directors, technical directors, and animators worked together to develop new ways of achieving realistic textures of hair, skin, and clothing. It's a pretty strong challenge uh, to get uh, just a simple thing as the transparency of the skin to work. With Fiona, for example, we have a very complex system of dermis, epidermis, and base. And that's an old technique of oil painting. You basically don't paint one color straight. You paint a glaze of red, another of yellow, and then you have a base that reflects the light. 
To avoid the plasticky look of perfect computer animated skin, the artist supplied a shader, which is a mini program that determines how a surface will be influenced by light. Fiona's hair presented even more difficulties than her skin. Unlike Donkey's fur, which has a shader painted onto the static surface of his body, controls for the hair on Fiona were much more complicated and were built into the character's setup. The hair involved a completely different rendering system, and like almost everything in computer animation, required a symbiosis of technical direction, animation, lighting, and visual effects. I think that the accomplishments that we had was having this uh, posable dynamic kinematic system for hair, and uh, so far, as far as we know, we ha it hasn't been done before to be able to control dynamics in a friendly way for the motion animators to use. With Fiona um, developing her character, we probably spent all of a year doing her character setup, painting the textures on her face and dealing with the lighting before she looked good. Man, that was annoying! A year in setup and two years in layout, animation, lighting and texturing and Fiona was ready to be introduced to the actor who brings her to life vocally. I really was kind of taken back because I was watching myself and it was so bizarre to see the mannerisms and the sort of the essence of kind of myself. The way she carried herself was a, something that I recognized and it was really wild to see that. The human characters are only part of the story of Shrek because in animation, everything must be created from scratch. The sets, the camera movements, the effects, the dust in the air, the shadows, all begin in the mind of the artist and depend on the ingenuity of computer technicians. Oh, now we getting somewhere. Shrek takes audiences into a fantasy world comprised of nearly 40 separate locations. Each location is painstakingly constructed in the computer and then simple puppet-like characters are inserted to establish camera angles and movement. This first step of the film's process into three dimensions is called layout. You can block out the action like a play. You know, with stand-in characters trying to figure out what's a good way for the scene to go before you even take it to the animators. In 3D animation, the sky's the limit for camera work. But to keep the film natural, the producers of Shrek chose not to use impossible camera angles. We wanted to actually give it a very live-action feel. So we, to some degree, restricted our use of camera to what you'd see in a real live-action film. Although there's still some shots where to show the action best, we found we could do a crane shot or a helicopter shot that would be very hard to shoot in live action. So we kind of got the best of both worlds. The sensibility, uh, the approach, uh, your intellectual approach, your aesthetic approach, and production approach up to a point is really live action. What we found here at PDI in 3D filmmaking, you really do mimic all the great cinematography techniques that everybody else uses out there in the live action domain. We, inside the computer you have a whole range of lenses and we, we swap around just as you would in all traditional photography shooting in live action. You can see how it's zooming from a wide angle to a, to a longer lens. And that's a kind of really exciting thing as an editor to be able to pick up the phone and say try moving the camera to the left and panning over to the right at the end of the shot and can you add some camera shake. A common live-action camera technique was used to add tension to the scene where Donkey and Shrek cross the wobbly bridge to the Dragon's Keep. The bridge was great because it really felt, we tried to make it as steady cam feel as possible and so that gave a nice, nice touch to the sequence. You suddenly realized you, were, you could be standing on the bridge. So this is the actual camera view and it appears that the bridge is much more, is jostling and bouncing a lot more than it is when you go and you look at the camera view, the camera is actually bouncing and rolling itself. The sophisticated camera work picked up the tremendous detail in the environment. Over 28,000 trees, 3 billion leaves, and 1,250 props are packed into the movie. All of this detail created a tremendous strain on the computer resources of the company. We have basically a new lush environment in every sequence. So there were a lot of areas of added complexity that all added up to you know, a big challenge for us both on how to develop the looks and make you know, the technology work and then also be able to do it with, within the, our resources of you know, rendering and, um, and machines. I think we started out with about, I think roughly about 525 processors let's say, a and also we incorporate all of the desktop machines that the animators are using at night into the rendering equation. So at night, the number of processors 
involved in rendering could go up as high as maybe 800. The textures, shadows, lighting, and color of the film are the handiwork of the lighting department. Here, the characters and settings are textured to give them an organic look. It's something where there is a, um, a program that is effectively sort of running over the surface of the, of the character, if you will, and, and creating this texture on the fly. And a great example is like the grass that you see in the background there. That was a shader that we actually used. We actually used fur for grass because it worked out really well. We were able to grow fur from the surface. Well, why don't we just make the fur look like grass blades? And we ended up being able to just elaborate on one shader to make another shader. Um, we also do things with geometry shaders where um, procedural programs will create um, pieces of geometry, rocks, plants, th things like that. Um, that don't exist as models, but they're created at the time that the image is rendered. Even with Shrek's inventive camera work, state-of-the-art lighting, near-human characters, and an organic realism, there's still something missing. Something that every contemporary film must have. Donkey, look out! <laughs> Visual effects. In a computer animated movie, anything that's not character animation, set design, or camera movement is considered a visual effect. Fire, mud, rain, dust, they're, they're the things that make a world come to life. And once again, the computer has empowered us to do things today that we'd only dreamed of only 18 months or two years ago. Shrek's mud bath was created using the fluid simulation systems designed for ants. The system enabled the effects department to create a range of liquids with different viscosities, rendering milk and mud and even foamy beer effects for the tournament scene. The same basic technology was used to much scarier effect when Donkey and Shrek crossed the lava-filled moat to the Dragon's Keep. Oh, you can't tell me you're afraid of heights. No, I'm just a little uncomfortable about being on a rickety bridge over a boiling lake of lava. To do the lava, we um, created you know, spurts that would look interesting, and then on the, the surface of the lava is what we call a height field, um, which is basically a grid that um, you make go up and down in certain places, and that gives you uh, a fluid-like looking surface. And then we um, brought it into some programs that we have in order to make the texture on the top feel like it's swirling around. Coo. In the climactic rescue scene, Shrek, Donkey, and Fiona escape from the castle, pursued by a fire-breathing dragon. And it is possible to integrate live-action elements into the scene, but the effects department decided to use computer-generated fire, which offered much more control. Basically, you know, you figure out what direction you want it to move out of the dragon's mouth, um, simulate that with a number of spheres as well, a particle system for that. Um, and make sure you get the right kind of billowing and um, turbulence and turmoil in that. And so we developed some special techniques for rendering that and give, putting what we call noise on it and processing that in the right way. And then at the end, it goes through a 2D process to you know, give the final kind of you know, glows and look to make it look like fire. Basically, we started off with um, just a very simple ball and we just animated the ball at the camera to get the timing right. And they started building their effects on top of that timing. So we would then, um, we'd have a simplified bunch of triangles just fly out at you. And then it would get slightly more blobby and more detailed. And then finally you see in lighting, you see an amazing effect coming out at you straight at your face. So um, we just started off very simply and then build from there. Hi, <laughs> ah, princess! It talks! Yeah, it's getting them to shut up, that's the trick! <laughs> The making of Shrek is a marriage between the high-tech world we inhabit and the age-old techniques of the artist. For all its sophistication, the technology used to create Shrek is in some ways as simple as a pencil drawing a picture. Artistically, this is a very well-integrated visual film that has a look that fits the story and um, a style of animation that fits the tone of the picture. The dust in the air, the, the, the leaves moving in the trees, the wind in the grass, the footsteps, the, uh, the, the very precise lighting. It's a very intricate process and, and, and it requires all the talent of everybody. And then all the effects and all the, the wind blowing and the dust and the smoke and the fire, I think, just bring a richness and a reality to our world that's so valuable when you're trying to create this illusion of life. 
Despite all the technological achievements, the creators of Shrek are hoping that the audience doesn't even notice their work. The thing that's fun of working on this is not the technology or the techniques that we use, but you know, it's the actual film itself and entertaining the audience and making them laugh is the important thing. One of the things that's really exciting is that I feel like we're, we're just getting to the point now where computer animation is really maturing a little bit and, and, and getting into this realm where people are starting to, to think about a lot of different stylistic options that they've got. So someone comes in here with something that's going to push us really far technologically and that's what we want to do, great, we'll go there. We're not afraid. That's the cool part of working with such smart people, the combination of scientist artists that we have here. In the end, Shrek's producers used all the advanced technological tools at their disposal to reach a very old-fashioned end to tell a good story. Man, <laughs> isn't this romantic? Just look at that sunset. In the broadest sense, technology allows an artist today to actually be able to create anything they can imagine. I was blown away. I'd never seen anything like that. It, uh, I always loved the animations in fairy tale books, and now they had this 3D universe that I just didn't want to leave. That's what's special about the film. It's, it strikes you as completely unusual and new. I mean, I imagine this film is going to strike people the way Snow White did. Just the fact that it's so overwhelmingly beautiful to look at. It really, uh, visually, it really, really blows your mind. You know, it goes like, look how far this has come. Look how far animation has come. Oh, now I really see what's going on here.